This is the Digging for Truth podcast, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research, demonstrating the historical reliability of the Bible through archaeological and biblical research. We've got a lot of archaeological finds to talk about today, so we should probably just get right into it because there's so much to say about these things and we'll just be scratching the surface. We've got Henry Smith here, along with Brian Wendell. He's the pastor of Island Bible Chapel in Canada and runs the Bible Archaeology Report at BibleArchaeologyReport.com. So, hey, how's it going, Brian? It's nice to see you again. Sounds good. Or was that the start? Did that I was it. That? Sorry, oh, we okay, started. okay, sorry. <laughs> Try that again. <laughs> <laughs> I missed it, man. <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, so, we wanted to talk to you today about the top 10 finds of all time in biblical archaeology related to the Old Testament. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about this list, how you came up with it? And, you know, I'm sure everyone's got a list. And so why is yours better than everybody else's and that kind of stuff? <laughs> well, here's the thing about uh, top 10 lists. I started doing them on my on my website, BibleArchaeologyReport.com. And um, I love top 10 lists because we can always compare, right? I, you know, we, I can compare my list with other people's lists. And this kind of grew out of the top 10 list I did at the end of each year. I do a yearly top 10 discoveries of the year. And, uh, and I look at the top 10 lists that other people put together. There are some other really good top 10 lists. And for me, part of the fun is comparing my list to other people's lists. And so out of that, I got thinking, well, you know, what were the top 10 finds of all time? And that, of course, uh, usually where I start, because I tend to think logically and linearly, I started, well, what would be my criteria for this? And so um, the kind of the criteria that I used was that the discovery has to be directly related to biblical people or people groups or places or events. And the key word there is directly, or it must be related to the composition of the Bible itself. And I did that because when I got my ESV, Archaeology Study Bible, they have a top 10 list in there, uh, in the front of that Bible. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to compare my list to theirs. And they have, I think they have the number one discovery all time as the Rosetta Stone. Now, the Rosetta Stone is a, is a fantastic discovery. I mean, it was, it was discovered by Napoleon's army in 1799. It was the key to finally being able to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics because it was inscribed, the stone is inscribed with three different languages, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, uh, ancient Egyptian demotic, and then, and then Greek. And so because we knew Greek and because the inscription was virtually the same in each language, it was kind of the key to cracking Egyptian hieroglyphics. And that's a great find, but it, for my criteria, it wasn't directly related to people, places, or events in scripture. It, it certainly has unlocked a whole culture, really, that helps us understand a lot of the background of the Bible, but not really directly related. So I didn't include it in my list, even though it might be included in another list, like in the ESV Archaeology Study Bible. So when, I, when I'm looking through your list, I'm wondering, so what about some of those other ancient things that exist, like the cave of the patriarchs, where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are traditionally thought as being buried? I know there's a lot of other examples that should point to affirming the Old Testament. Now, how come those didn't make your list? Is that because maybe they're questionable? Like, I'm curious about some of those things. Yeah, sometimes it's just a matter of what emphasis you're placing on things. So, for example, you mentioned the Cave of the Patriarchs. That made my top 10 list on Abraham. It's an important okay. ancient site. Cave of the Patriarchs is a little hard because we don't have access to it. Yeah. In terms of getting down. Now, that doesn't mean there, there are stories of clandestine visits down to the, the subterranean caves in the Cave of the Patriarchs. You know, certainly, I believe it's a Herodian monument structure that is there, which is just spectacular. But in terms of being able to get down and do actual excavations in there, you can't do that. So there's some limited value. It's, 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 it's important. Made my top 10 list on Abraham, but just not as significant in my mind as these 10 that, that are here. Cool. So let's just start with number 10. What's, uh, what's the number 10 find from the Old Testament? Well, the number 10 find, I decided on, on a general 
find, and, and that's Assyrian inscriptions. And the reason for that is that there are numerous Assyrian inscriptions that all work together to not only confirm Firm historical details of numerous kings of Israel because there was interaction between the kings of Judah and Israel and the kings of Assyria, uh, but also it helps us to establish a biblical chronology. If, when you read the Old Testament, right, you notice that there are no absolute dates. They didn't use BC or, or, or anything like that or BCE, the new term. They didn't. They they. It was all relative dating. So there might be a prophecy given in relation to a particular uh, year of a king's reign. But the discovery of a number of Assyrian inscriptions allow us to establish an absolute chronology for many of the events in the Old Testament. So let me explain how that's done. First of all, there are what is called the... um, the Assyrian Limu lists. And the Assyrians had this practice of naming each year after a person, which was called the Limu. He was either a high official in the court or a governor of a province, or maybe even the king itself. And then historical events were then dated in terms of that Limu year. And so um, when Austin Henry Laird excavated at Nineveh, he discovered a number of cuneiform tablets, including four copies of Assyrian Limu lists. And this had like over 250 years of Assyrian history dated to specific years that are named after individuals. And so that was really helpful, but still only still only relative dating. But there was one particular tablet that listed an eclipse of the sun that took place in the month of Semenu in the year of the Limu uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Bursagali or Bursagal. And hmm. and astronomy has fixed the date of that eclipse as June 15th, 763 BC. So we we anchor that one. And now we have absolute dates for over 250 years of Assyrian history. So, wow. so that's the first type of, of Assyrian inscription. And then we have the Assyrian, the annals of Assyrian kings, because when the Assyrian kings interacted with the kings from the West, including Israel and, and Judah, they would note some of these things. So one inscription, for example, is the Kirk monolith of Shalmaneser III, and it lists King Ahab as one of the kings that was part of a Western coalition that fought against him at the Battle of Kakar, which has been dated to 853 BC. Then we have another inscription, the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III, and it states that King Jehu brought a uh, tribute to Shalmaneser, and and it's dated 841 BC. And um, it's amazing. I mean, the Black Obelisk, I mean, it has a carving of, of a figure bowing down that may indeed be King Jehu. So this may be the only likeness of a, of a, of a Hebrew king that we have. Wow. But this, all of this dating then allows us to establish a chronology. So in his book, The Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings, um, scholar Edwin Thiele successfully reconstructed the chronology of the entire Hebrew monarchy. Uh, both in the divided kingdom period and the united monarchy period from these dates. And so uh, these limulists, the annals of the Assyrian kings, have allowed scholars to establish uh, an absolute chronology so that we know when in history uh, these events actually happened. That's great stuff, Brian. You know, there's so much to take take out of that uh, for us. One, one of the things I, th- I think of, and which we've talked about a lot of different different times together, the details of the chronology that's in the biblical text during this time period, the divided kingdom is what we're talking about. And then, of course, what you just outlined in these synchronisms from outside scripture, especially the eclipse, how precisely accurate it is. I mean, I mean, down to the months even in some cases, right? So you think about what's required for that biblical text to be written that way and to synchronize with these Assyrian records requires contemporary eyewitness authorship of these texts, which really goes against some of the prevailing models that are out there as far as the development of, of the biblical text goes. Now, I know we, you know, we've maybe someone hearing this for the first time, others have probably heard us say this many times, but there's just no way you could get these hundreds of details right unless the recorders that were in the the king's court, as it were, were eyewitnesses to the dates and the times. And then you've got this independent record in Assyria, which is totally independent of the scripture. So maybe com- comment on that a little, Brian. Uh, 
I think that's a powerful argument that makes our case about the reliability of the Bible. Yeah, I, I think you're right, because someone might accuse the biblical writers of having some sort of an agenda when they wrote it and making up these glorious kings and 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 their reigns. But then when you have attested, um, not just, by the way, in Assyrian writings, you've got Babylonian writings, the, the Babylonian Chronicles, for example, that also affirm, we'll talk about one of them coming up, but also affirm details that are in the biblical text. And now you go, well, hang on, you might accuse biblical writers of that, but you certainly can't accuse the pagan Babylonian writers or Assyrian court recorders <laughs> yeah. of, of trying to further, you know, the, the agenda of Yahweh, like you might, some people might suggest was happening with the annals of the kings. And so, yeah, I think that's right. There's another interesting thing too. When people first looked at the Hebrew kings, for example, and they, they looked at the, the data that was there for their reigns, and, and they started adding them up. They were like, oh my goodness, this is a hopeless mess. It's impossible to solve this. It, they're, they're just making this stuff up. But then when Edwin Thiele sat down to, to look at it, he recognized that there were different types of recording the reigns, a session year reigning, non-accession year reigning, whether they included the first year of their reign as year one or year zero, and that was different in each kingdom, and then recognizing that one kingdom had a spring new year and another had the fall new year, so now you're off by another six months, and then you've also got some overlapping co-regencies that are hinted at in Scripture, and when you put all of that together— all of a sudden, everything falls into place. And then when you compare it to the Assyrian data, it falls right into line as well. And so what you see is that the Bible was correct all along. These were accurately recorded by the court recorders and the scribes all the way through Israel's history. And just for me, the dumb one in the room uh, is, so the Assyrians, like that, you said it was like 763 was that eclipse and then... Uh, it's so kind of like this is like a few hundred years after the reign of David. Is yeah, that kind of that this time frame. That's right. Yeah, uh, there there were a number of world empires, right? That that yeah. ruled, and and some have argued that Assyria was the first major world empire that that kind of took over much of the known world at that time, and they were probably at their height in the. Uh, the 8th century BC, and and when a lot of this kind of things happened. And then they were followed, of course, by the Babylonians, and then they were followed by the Persians. But yeah, this time frame is, is a couple hundred years after David, a few hundred years, 250 years after David, when we start seeing a lot of this interaction between the, the Hebrew kings and the kings of Assyria. So speaking of kings, Brian, how about uh, the next one? King Cyrus. Yeah. Number nine. Number nine, I picked King Cyrus, a Persian king, and and the very famous, famous inscription called the Cyrus Cylinder. Now, King Cyrus is mentioned some 20 times in Scripture. Uh, the prophet Daniel was still in Babylon when Cyrus conquered the city, and he's named in numerous uh, inscriptions. But from a biblical perspective, Cyrus is probably most famous for his decree that allowed the Jewish people to return from Jerus to Jerusalem from the exile and to rebuild their temple. Now, again, to set the historical context, right? God's people had sinned. The prophets kept calling them to repentance and God prophesied, look, come back or something bad's going to happen. Jeremiah kept prophesying that the, the, the Babylonians were going to come. And, and sure enough, the Babylonians came um, in multiple times and took the people of Judah to, to exile in Babylon. Well, the Babylonian empire fell to the Persian Empire, and Cyrus uh, was one of the, the most important kings, and, and he allowed the people to go back. It's recorded, it was prophesied in Isaiah, Isaiah 44, 28. It's recorded in Second Chronicles and in the book of Ezra. And so we had this, but there were some people who were still, you know, 19th century critics were like, yeah, listen, a king, a new king taking over is not going to let all of his, all of these captured peoples just go back to their places. That's not good foreign policy in the, in the ancient Near East. But then in 1879, the Cyrus Cylinder was discovered in the ruins of Babylon. And this, it's a clay cylinder. 
And it, it's about 25 and a half centimeters by 10 centimeters. And it's inscribed in cuneiform in Akkadian. And it affirms that this was indeed the policy of Cyrus, not just to allow the Jews to go back, but all of the people who the Babylonians had captured and, and put into exile. They let them all go home. And here's, here's what it says. I'll read a part of it. It says, I am Cyrus, king of the world, great king, mighty king, king of Babylon, king of Sumer and Akkad, king of the four quarters, the son of Cambyses, the great king of Asan, grandson of Cyrus, the great king of Anson, a descendant, etc., etc., etc. And then he says, from Babylon as far as the region of Gutium, the sacred centers on the other side of the Tigris, whose sanctuaries had been abandoned for a long time, I returned the images of the gods who had resided there to their places. I let them dwell in their eternal abodes. I gathered all their inhabitants and returned them to their dwellings. May the gods whom I settled in their sacred centers ask daily Bel and Nabu, that's where, those were his gods, that my days be long and they may intercede for my welfare. So rather than retaining the gods of the captured people, remember we have this described in um, in at the beginning of Daniel, right? Nebuchadnezzar comes, he captures all of the things from the temple and he brings them and he puts them into uh, the temple of his gods. And presumably Nebuchadnezzar had done this with other captured people, but they would have had idols. So he would have taken the idols and put them in the temple of his god demonstrating that he believed his God was the strongest. Well, when Cyrus allows the people to return, all the peoples, he returns all these gods to the people, says, go back and rebuild your temples. And, and of course, he's trying to placate himself in the view of all the gods. But for the Jewish people, they didn't have idols. And so uh, Dr. Wood, Dr. Bright Wood explains, he says, in the case of the Jews, however, since they had no idols, the gold and silver articles taken from the temple were returned. And the specific proclamation pertaining to the Jews is documented in Ezra. So we read in Ezra 1, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the mouth by the prophet Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his peoples, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And so what the Cyrus Cylinder does is it establishes for us that this is perfectly in keeping with now a known historical event. In fact, the Cyrus Cylinder, I believe there's a copy of it held in the, in the, in the offices of the United Nations because it's often seen as the first, uh, one of the first human rights documents allowing captured people to go free. Wow. And so where, whereas one people used to scoff at that kind of a notion, we now know that, that it's accurate and that the Bible, again, is describing something that fits contextually with what was happening in history at that time. Well, that's extraordinary. There's so much to say about that, Brian, but your last comment really made me think uh, something I was thinking about theologically here, because we could talk about historical and the writing of a text and all that, which is all important. <laughs> so two thoughts. One is the sovereignty of God. He stirs up the heart of this pagan king to do what's right. Okay. So isn't that a message for us now? that we can rest in the, in the sovereignty of God. We, as, as Jesus talked about, you know, the Holy Spirit is like the wind. He comes and goes, but we never know which direction he's coming from and which way he's going, right? He talks about the wind and this, so it is with the Spirit. And so it is with the Spirit of God operating on the behalf of God's people in ways that we can't discern on our own. It's, it's right extraordinary. The other thing is, it's interesting, the United Nations is basically an organization that's in rebellion against God, doesn't recognize God's authority. So they put this cylinder as sort of a centerpiece of the sort of ethos that they want to emulate, but they ignore the God that's the one that stir up the heart of Cyrus to do it to begin with. Isn't that, isn't that kind of ironic if you think about it that way? Oh, it's dripping with irony, right? It's dripping. And, and, and the fact that they have, you know, in their offices, this document, which I don't know that they fully understand just what a powerful testimony it is for the authenticity of Scripture. And, and there it is for all to see. Yeah. 
Yeah, great stuff. Great stuff. All right, what's number eight? Number eight is the Mernepta Stila. Now, we need to explain just a couple of things here, maybe for our listeners. Uh, the first is uh, what a stila is. It's a victory monument. Kings would set these up when they had gone on a successful campaign or maybe... Uh, when they wanted people to think they had gone on a successful campaign. So they would set these up, and Mernepta was a pharaoh. Uh, He was a 13th century BC pharaoh in Egypt. And the Bible records that throughout their histories, the Israelites and the Egyptians had some significant interactions on numerous occasions. And what's really interesting is that uh, we read about the Egyptians in the Hebrew Bible, but we also read about the the Hebrew people in a number of Egyptian inscriptions, and maybe our listeners may not know that. This is probably the most famous. It's the Mernepta Stila. In, in 1896, Sir Flinders Petrie discovered this huge monument. It's 10 feet tall, and it, it recounted the victories of Pharaoh Mernepta, and Mernepta reigned for about a decade, 1213 to 1203 B.C., And it's an account of his victories, primarily over the Libyans, but on the very bottom, at the last three lines, it deals with a separate campaign into Canaan. Probably sometime around 1208, 1210 um, is, is where it's mostly dated. And so then he erected this monument in the temples at Thebes, and, and he boasted of his conquest. And, and for our purposes, the line that really strikes us is where he claims that, and I'll quote, Israel is wasted, its seed is not, and Huru, that is Canaan, is become a widow because of Egypt. Now, uh, we believe based on, we get into some chronological issues here, particularly as it relates to the Exodus, and and so we might get into that a little bit, but we believe that this campaign likely occurred during the period of the Judges, and and based on, on the chronology that we would follow, and First, what's really interesting is that Israel is listed along with cities of Canaan, such as Ascalon uh, and Gezer, which are also named in in the stila. And the interesting thing is that the name Israel is the only one followed by the hieroglyphic symbol that denotes a people rather than a political entity. This, along with the structure of the inscription, indicates that Israel, that Egypt viewed Israel as this ethnic or social group with no fixed boundaries in the land of Canaan. So it's not just a city-state, it's, it's a people group there. And they were powerful enough to be mentioned along with major city-states. Moreover, the fact that Israel is presented in parallel with Huru or Canaan, since Israel's seed is not all Canaan, is become considered to become a widow, implies that Egypt viewed Israel as the most powerful people group in Canaan. And so it's important for that reason. It's important because it's the oldest definitive reference as a nation to Israel outside of the Bible. Now, there are two other inscriptions that are older that I believe do refer to uh, the Hebrew people. Uh, One is a Solib inscription, which refers to the, the nomads of Yahweh, which we, which I believe is a reference to the to the Israelites. There's the Berlin pedestal, which refers to Israel, and because of where it's the other two name rings, which are also from Canaan, it, it seems to be for, uh, referring to Israel. Now there's debate about that, and then there's debate about uh, when it dates, but nobody really disputes the fact that Mernepta Stila refers to Israel. But here's where it gets interesting. When it comes to the date of the Exodus and the date of the conquest, when we we look at it, of course, the the key text, there are a number of key texts, but probably the key one is in 1 Kings 6.1, right? That says in the 480th year after they left Egypt, they, they built the temple. So you just do the math if you take the numbers in a literal, straightforward way. And that would place the uh, exodus from Egypt in 1446 or so. Uh, but then there, are, so that's the early day. But some people say, well, no, 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 it, it actually the better fits maybe they think in 1270 BC or something, the, the late date for the exodus. But here's the problem, I think, with the, the late date as it relates to the Mernepta Stila. After wandering in the desert for 40 years, the uh, Israelites do this prolonged conquest of Canaan. It's not, it didn't happen in a night. It, it, seven years to start, probably, most scholars would say, and they, and they still didn't get the job done at that point. And so here's the thing. If the Bernepta Stila really does date to 1208 to 1210, 
there really is not enough time between 1270 and when Merneptah's campaign was for the Exodus, the 40 years of wandering in the desert, the conquest of Canaan, the establishment of the nation of Israel there before Merneptah claims to have conquered them, and for them to be seen as the most powerful nation people group that was in Canaan at the time. And so I think it's an important witness not only to Israel as a people in Canaan, as the Bible says, but I think it has some important implications for the date of the Exodus and the conquest as well. That's awesome, Brian. That's a that's a boatload of uh, of great stuff. You know, it's interesting too. You mentioned the uh, Solib inscription. If my memory serves, correct me if I'm wrong. That also is referring to them not as a state per se, but as a people group, the nomads of Yahweh. And now, now we see the Merneptah Stila. So we see a recognition by Egyptians of sort of what's most important about these people is their sort of unified, not political identity per se, but sort of ethnic identity, if you want to say that, or religious association, especially with the Solib inscription. It's really interesting because what you pointed out too is in the book of Judges, even though it's a couple centuries after the conquest, we know from Judges that the Israelites are still trying to settle into their tribal allotments. They're having all these problems with the Canaanites. The Philistines are on the horizon. Yep. Uh, so, so there's a lot there, I think, that you're putting your finger at that really uh, shows, the, shows the early date is the, better, is the better choice for a whole bunch of reasons, but also just sort of the state of affairs, you know, sort of snapshot in time of what's going on there that really fits very nicely with what the biblical text says. And again, it goes back to, you know, eyewitness and all that kind of thing. What's, uh, what's number seven on your list? All right, number seven is the Misha inscription. It's also known as the Moabite stone. And, and this is just an amazing find in and of itself, but how it was find and, and, and how we still have it. I mean, you could make a movie out of this particular, the adventure wrapped up in this. But in 1868, there was an Anglican missionary named Frederick Klein who was working in the area of modern-day Jordan. And uh, he had heard about this stone, this this black basalt stone monument in Jordan with this inscription, and there was an offer to purchase it, and, and there was all sorts of conflict, and, and, and then this squeeze was taken, so pressing paper mache into the monument to get a copy of the inscription, and then shortly thereafter, the, the Bedouin tribes uh, poured hot water on the stone and broke it so that nobody could get it, and then they took pieces, and then they bought a whole bunch of pieces back, and thankfully they had... The the squeeze still, so they have been able to reconstruct the inscription on the Moabite stone, and it, and it describes, it's an inscription of Misha, who was a Moabite king. Now, astute Bible students will go, well, hang on, that sounds familiar, and it should, because in 2 Kings 3, we read about King Misha of Moab. 2 Kings 3, 4 to 6 says, now, Misha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, And he had to deliver to the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But when Ahab, that's the king of Israel, died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Jehoram marched out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. When you compare that to the Moabite stone, it reads this way. I am Misha, son of of Chemosh, or Chemosh, that was his, his god, the king of Moab, the Dibionite from Dibon. It goes on to say, Omri was king of Israel, and he oppressed Moab for many days because Chemosh or Chemosh was angry with his land, and his son replaced him and said, I will oppress Moab, but I was victorious over him and his house, and Israel suffered everlasting destruction, and I built the temple of Baal Maon, and I established there the sheep of the land. And, and so what's neat about this particular discovery is that we have both sides of this event described. Now the Moabite stone describes much more than this particular event. It's kind of looking back at Misha's reign, um, likely written maybe later in his reign, looking at a number of things. If you read all 30 some odd lines of it, you get you get more of the flavor of it. But it's significant for a few reasons. First of all, it corroborates events in 2 Kings 3 that Moab was subject to Israel but rebelled, just as the Bible says. It confirms that the primary god of the Moabites was Chemosh or Chemosh. It contains, interestingly, a reference to Yahweh. It appears that after 
Misha was successful in his rebellion. He went about retaking some of the cities that the Israelites had. And he, one of the things he claims to have taken were the altar hearths of Yahweh, the altar hearths of Yahweh. We don't really know what they, those were, but we have that mention. So it's, it's a very early mention of Yahweh, the Israelite God outside the Bible. And in 1994, Andre Lemaire, a great epigrapher, was able to identify a particular letter and says it actually talks about the house of David in there. That phrase is in there, and it's been in the news over the last couple of years because they have taken a number of new photographs of the squeeze where they shone light through the back of the squeeze and took photographs, and, an, and another study where they took multiple angles of multiple new high-resolution photos, which they then all merged into a three-dimensional image. And when they do that, they discover that it does indeed say the house of David. So it's it's important for that. So so hugely important uh, inscription as it relates to biblical history. Yeah, that's great. I you know I was thinking of a couple of things. One is archaeology uh, is it's interesting. It has multiple levels in terms of what we do. We find finds in the field, then they're analyzed and published. They're debated. But then technology changes, so we can go back and sort of do archaeology all over again. Not not digging it up in the field per se, but but this new technology that's helping us to see this writing is really quite extraordinary. Just to help us to make sure that it's been understood correctly and all that kind of thing. So you know, it's an ongoing thing. We never fully, in ca- some cases, never fully get to all the facts. There's more to know about things. I think that's a good lesson for the church. You know, when the skeptics are saying, well, we don't have evidence for this, we don't have evidence for that. Even with finds that we have already, there's more information to be deciphered. So I think that's interesting. The other thing is, I think we could think of this as what we call a hostile witness, right? Mesha is not a friend of Israel. And so, you know, it's sort of like um, uh, Jesus being refound in the in the Talmud. You know, the rabbis... Uh, did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and yet he's mentioned in the Talmud. This is what we call, you know, a hostile witness. They have no uh, reason to advance the person of Jesus. In fact, they're opposed to him, right? So here we have the house of David being mentioned. And of course, what you're also getting at is this is, what, century and a half, two centuries later, it's clear that David is still considered the the quintessential king, even by the enemies of Israel. That's actually more powerful than if it was contemporaneous in some ways, I think. Yeah, and and it's historically accurate. That's how foreign nations referred to particular areas. A, a comparison, for example, is Assyria. For hundreds of years after Omri, they were still referring in Assyrian inscriptions, they were still referring to Israel as Omri land. That's the literal translation of the word they used for Israel. And so, oh, yeah. so the kind of the main strongest king is is what that land became known as. That's that's historically accurate. So when we come to the Misha inscription and it refers to the house of David, that's perfectly in keeping with what we know from other ancient inscriptions, how they referred to particular territories. And one other thing that I picked up that you said, so this is the earliest mention of Yahweh outside of Israel, or is it just in all time, like it's the earliest mention of Yahweh other than the Bible? Well, it would be, that would be outside of Israel because we now have a mention of Yahweh with big news that broke this year with the lead tablet that was found at Mount Ebal. And, And that would predate this inscription by hundreds of years, it appears, and it refers to Yahweh. And so, that's one of the things I love about biblical archaeology. We'll have this early um, reference to Yahweh, and then we've got an even earlier reference to Yahweh. This would be the earliest reference to Yahweh, I would say, east of the Jordan. We have the Solab inscription, which is down in modern-day Sudan, which is even earlier. It's around 1400 BC mentioning to Yahweh. And now we have this inscription in Israel, which is really just amazing because there are relatively speaking, very few inscriptions of any kind that are found in Israel from ancient times, Iron Age and earlier. And so when you start staying up to date on things, and as Henry mentioned, right, like you've got 
new technologies that are being developed. Uh, just to mention another one, it, it, it just blows my mind. They they are able now to take scrolls that have been burned and charred beyond recognition, and with scans and computer imaging, they're able to digitally unwrap the scrolls and read them now without actually touching them. The, the technology just blows your mind. And in this case, with the Misha inscription, helpful for biblical archaeology. Sky's the limit. It really is. Yeah, cool. All right, so what's number six? All right, number six is the, it's called the Jerusalem Chronicle. That's kind of its its vernacular name. It's it's actually the, the Babylonian Chronicle. Um, for the year 605 to 595 uh, BC. The Babylonian Chronicles are this series of clay tablets. They're held in the British Museum, and they recount the history of the kings of Babylon. And the Babylonian Chronicle for 605 to 594 is really important because it speaks primarily of King Nebuchadnezzar, who's a very famous Babylonian king that's mentioned in the Bible. And it records the fall of Jerusalem under Nebuchadnezzar, and hence its nickname, the Jerusalem Chronicle. This is this is what it reads, and, and I'll add a few things as I go, just so we can understand. It says, in the seventh year, that's 597 BC, uh, the month of Kislimu, the king of Akkad, that's Nebuchadnezzar, he mustered his troops, he marched to Hatti land, that's kind of the general area where Judah was resided, in, and, and it says he besieged the city of Judah, and on the second day of the month, and he gives the month, it's it's basically February, March, 597, he seized the city and he captured the king. That's King Jehoiakim. We read about that in 2 Kings 24, 8 to 17. And then he appointed there a king of his own choice. That was Jehoiakim's uncle, Mataniah, who became king of Judah and had his name changed to Zedekiah. That's 2 Kings 24, 17. And received its heavy tribute and sent to Babylon. And so this account, this Babylonian chronicle, refers to the second de- deportation of Hebrews in 597. The first is it was in 605 BC. It's actually implied in the Babylonian Chronicles as well, where he it says he marched unopposed through Hatti land and took tribute. One of the tribute he took in the earlier, the first deportation would have been Daniel, uh, the prophet. And so we have this one described in great detail, which matches the description in the Bible in 2 Kings 24. It fits the biblical description of Nebuchadnezzar's siege, the capture of Jerusalem, the deportation of uh, of King Jehoiakim, the appointment of Zedekiah, the heavy tribute taken back to Babylon. The Second Chronicles 36, it says the treasures from the temple and the treasures of the kings were taken. And so it confirms this event, but it also gives uh, the date that the city of Jerusalem fell as March 16th, 597 BC, if you converted their relative dating into uh, our modern absolute dating system. And so just a, a really important thing. I should also mention about the Babylonian Chronicles. They're kind of interesting because a lot of ancient inscriptions are very polemic. They're, they're obviously propaganda that the king is putting out. And people have noticed that the Babylonian Chronicles tend to be different. They tend to be more balanced. They tend to be more record and, and statement of fact rather than aggrandizing a, a particular king. And so um, uh, many scholars uh, would take things that are in the Babylonian Chronicles and say they, they maybe are a little more accurate and a little bit more balanced and honest in, in what they're describing. And so isn't it interesting? We have this description of the fall of Jerusalem we ha- again, we have the other side of the story, right? We've got the Jewish description of, of from their perspective, but then we have this in the Babylonian Chronicles. We get the Babylonian side as well. Yeah, it's interesting. Your last point there, Brian, is uh, the task of sifting through propaganda to get to the historical facts. It can be done, but you know we have that even in modern studies. You know, I'm a big, I have a big interest in World War II. And, you know, it's that's a subject that could be studied for the next two centuries. You know, there's still things to be discovered about it. But a lot of times there's historical events that you're still trying to sift through the ideology of the different players that were involved in that. So that's interesting. The other thing is what you outlined here, it impacts multiple biblical books, right? You mentioned Jeremiah 52, I think. Yep. Uh, Second, Second Kings, 
Yep. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, yep. And Daniel. Yep. So that's that's an interesting thing too. So it's 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 kind of we talked about the implications earlier about the Assyrian material and the divided kingdom period. But here we have, it's not just one book or one reference, but it's sort of like across the scope of the biblical text written by different authors, slightly different times, relatively contemporaneous. So that that's kind of interesting too. I think that just adds more credence to our overall point that we're making about all this in terms of eyewitness testimony and that. So I, I just think that's interesting, you know, I hadn't thought of that before until as you were going through it, the impact across these multiple books in the Old Testament scriptures. Now we're transitioning. We're moving into the top five. All right. So uh, people who followed my blog will notice that I've made a little change here. And so I, I did this list back in 2019, and and I'm just following things and, and updating things. And, and I'm going to cheat here. I'm just going to state right off that. Cards on the table, I'm cheating here because I'm I'm lumping, I'm squeezing a whole bunch of discoveries into number five. And the common theme is King Hezekiah. Now, King Hezekiah has a soft spot for me in scripture. He was a righteous king. Uh, he was a man of faith and um, not a perfect king, but a man of faith. And as a little aside, he is the way that I got connected with ABR. And so the first discovery that I want to mention here is, is the Hezekiah Bula. In 2015, Alat Mazar announced that a, uh, a Bula, now Bula is a, a clay seal impression, uh, had been discovered, and it was the seal impression of King Hezekiah. It was discovered while wet sifting material that had been excavated from a, a refuse dump in a royal building uh, in Jerusalem in the Ophel excavations. It's about a, a centimeter in diameter, and it bears this, this ancient Hebrew inscription that says, belonging to Hezekiah, a son of Ahaz, king of Judah. And what was interesting about this was that there were other Hezekiah Bule that, that we had, that we knew of from the antiquities market, but this was the first time that one was found in a documented excavation. And so that is uh, is particularly important. And that discovery was the very first breaking news update I ever wrote for ABR. And I've been doing it every week since that time, since, uh, since November, December, 2015. Uh, another awesome. one, we have Hezekiah's tunnel. The Bible records that King Hezekiah rebelled against the Assyrians. Um, his father had been paying tribute to them. He knew that when he rebelled and withheld tribute, that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, was going to come and would attack Jerusalem. So he began to make preparations. And in 2 Chronicles 32, 2-4, we read, When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that he intended to make war on Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside the city, and they helped him. Large force of men assembled. They blocked up the springs and the stream that flowed through the land. Why should the king of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they said. And it goes on to say it was Hezekiah who blocked up the outlet of the spring of Gian and channeled the water down the west side of the city of David. Second Kings 2020 also describes the tunnel that Hezekiah had dug in order to bring water in the city. And, and in 1838, Edwin Robinson discovered this ancient aqueduct in Jerusalem. And about 50 years later, some some uh, young people were exploring this aqueduct when they found on the wall about partway through this uh, Paleo-Hebrew inscription on the wall of the tunnel that Robinson had missed. And, and the inscription has been dated based on the, the lettering to about the 8th century BC, which is the time of Hezekiah. And the inscription records how the men digging the tunnel worked from two directions and they met in the middle. And that would be hard enough today. To do that, digging underground, to nail it right in the middle, but they were able to do it back in the 8th century BC, which is just amazing. And so this uh, inscription, this, the Siloam inscription it's called, the Tunnel of Hezekiah, both provide significant evidence of the historical events described uh, in the pages of Scripture, and and the, the Hezekiah's Tunnel is one of the, the most popular tourist attractions in Jerusalem today. You can still walk through the tunnel that Hezekiah built. You have Hezekiah's wall, the Jewish quarter we have of Jerusalem. They've uncovered further evidence. This massive wall, it's called a broad wall that dates to the time of Hezekiah, seven meters thick. And, and it was built by Hezekiah to enclose the Western Hill and increase the defensive nature of the city. And then probably the, the won't say the best, but the most popular and the most 
The most instructive for us is Sennacherib's own annals. Again, we have this this event described in the Bible, but we also have it described in the Assyrian inscriptions. The annals of Sennacherib, we actually have three different copies of it. We have the Taylor prism, the Oriental Institute prism, and the Jerusalem prism. There are three clay prisms. They, They contain the same text recording this particular event, and on it... Sennacherib boasts, as for Hezekiah the Judahite, who did who had not submitted to my yoke, I surrounded 46 of his strong walled towns and innumerable small places around them and conquered them by means of earth ramps and siege engines, attacked by infantrymen, mining and breaching and scaling. 200,000 people of all ranks, men, women, horses, mules, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep without number, I brought out of the country as spoil. He himself... I shut in Jerusalem, his royal city, like a bird in a cage. And he also you know, goes on to say, the fear of my lordly splendor overwhelmed Hezekiah. And he confirms in this inscription that Hezekiah paid him tribute. Now, if you read the biblical account, which is described in not only the book of Kings, but we we have it in the book of Isaiah. So we have it across multiple books of the Bible. We read that that Hezekiah or that Sennacherib did indeed come, that he defeated, defeated cities of Judah, that he laid siege to Jerusalem, that Hezekiah tried to pay him off by sending him tribute. And uh, Sennacherib took the tribute and kept on coming and, and laid siege to the city. And we read that God sent a, a, an angel to protect the people, killed the soldiers, the Assyrian soldiers, and Sennacherib returned to his own country. And so I find it interesting that what he brags about, what he boasts about in his in, in his annals is this. Not that he captured Jerusalem. Not that he deported King Hezekiah. No, what he says is, I shut him up in his city like a bird in a cage. It's a tacit admission that he didn't succeed in the siege of Jerusalem. And that affirms what we read in the biblical text too. That is a tour de force, Brian. I mean, has the Hezekiah material is just is just awesome. You and I and on, on our TV show have talked about a number of these things at times. And with another guest, Todd Boland, we did a whole episode just on the tunnel itself. You yeah. know, right? I mean, there's just so much to talk about there. I'm going to just zero in a little bit on Sennacherib because I find I find all of it interesting. But what I find most interesting, I think, is Hezekiah's faith. You know, if I could use a modern analogy, think of Germany and World War II surrounding Belgium. You know, a little country like Belgium. Yeah. But they don't conquer it. That's sort of like what's happening here. There's no reason, humanly speaking, the Assyrian army is the most powerful force in the world at this point in time. Uh, They're like old Egypt, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, bang, they don't take Jerusalem. There's there's just no reason that that doesn't happen. Now, of course, in the biblical text and not in the prisms, we find out the reason why. The other thing that's frightening about this, I think, well, I should say, gives great peace to those of us who follow the Lord and have entrusted our eternal souls with him, but frightening for those who are in rebellion, that God wipes out the entire Assyrian army. That is sobering in its scope, and it it is kind of like almost not a throwaway. It's not a throwaway in the text, but uh, it's very briefly mentioned in the text. So you know you read it, but when you read that, you got to stop and think about. There's no way out. There's no escape, and bang, the army is completely destroyed by the angel of the Lord. God will vindicate the righteous. And I think it's a call to repentance, too, for those who are in rebellion against God. You don't want to be an Assyrian soldier, right? You want to be on the side of of Jesus, who's loving and humble and kind and patient and gracious. But he's not coming back that way. He's coming back as a conquering king, right? So we want to remember that, I think, in terms of theology, in terms of the message that this is sending, and of course it's vindicated here by the archaeological record, the absence of any explanation in the Assyrian records is screaming at us. It's screaming at us. And so 
uh, I don't know. Those are, those are some thoughts. If you want to piggyback on them, feel free. Yeah. I think we don't, we don't like to talk about God's judgment and yet we see it over and over again in scripture, not just with foreign, foreign armies, with his own people yes, yes, as yes. well. The other thing I, I, I find heartening when I look at Hezekiah is Hezekiah's faith stumbled. When Sennacherib shows up, while he had withheld tribute initially, and that's what brought Sennacherib, Hezekiah starts to doubt. And so he's like, oh, okay, I'll send the tribute anyways. And Sennacherib takes it and keeps on coming. Again, that's a detail that's often missed in this story. And it's almost like God is forcing Hezekiah, no, you have to rely on me in this. Just trust me. And so finally, Hezekiah does put his faith in the Lord, and and the Lord says, okay, now watch, and and brings judgment on the Assyrian army and delivers delivers his people. Amen. Well, Brian, I hope that the next uh, four don't have four sub- (laughs) <laughs> no. What is the number four one you have on your list? All right. Number four is related to number five, right? It's still dealing with this Sennacherib's invasion, but it is just the stunning nature of it made me just have to keep it as a separate thing. When Sennacherib returned from invading Judah, he had carved on the walls in his palace basically this massive relief that goes uh, around uh, three or four different walls uh, in the museum it's in right now. It's just spectacular. And on it, it depicts his siege, not of Jerusalem. He couldn't boast of taking Jerusalem, but his siege of the city of Lachish. And so we know from Scripture that he was there. It it describes in uh, 2 Chronicles 32, he sends a a message from Lachish, where he is, to Hezekiah, who is at Jerusalem, saying, you know, on on what are you trusting? We, We read, after this Sennacherib, king of Assyria, who was besieging Lachish with his forces. So we have this description. And when they excavated Sennacherib's palace, they discovered these stunning reliefs. It's amazing that they survived. We see the Assyrian siege of the city. We see battering rams ascending a siege ramp, followed by Assyrian soldiers. We see Hebrew archers and soldiers throwing down rocks from the from the tower of the city, from the city gate to defend against the attackers. Uh, I mean, it, it's depicting actual images of Hebrew people at this time. We see uh, the battle kind of proceeds through each panel. The city falls. The Assyrian soldiers capture some of the soldiers. They they kill some of them. In one scene, we see the city gate open, inhabitants fleeing. We see Sennacherib sitting on the throne, and it it basically says uh, the inscription says that that he Sennacherib, king of Assyria, gives his blessing on this uh, this attack and uh, the city was taken, essentially, is my paraphrase of it. And then when you go to the city of Lachish, what you find there is, is the remains of the Assyrian siege ramp on the northwest corner uh, of the mound that's there. And, and again, we have this tacit admission, right? He can't boast of taking Jerusalem. So when he gets back to Assyria, what does he have on display? He has put on display his successful defeat of the city of Lachish, which was likely the second most important city in all of Israel at that time. Uh, this is one of my favorites too, uh, Brian. I, I call this sometimes uh, the reliefs, the ancient version of a photograph. So you have an artist there on site, someone who's a witness to this. In fact, I think I remember reading that scholars have even tried to figure out exactly what the artist's vantage point would have been. Uh, when he w- he had to draw what he was seeing, and then he would go back to the palace, and of course the artisans would have made the reliefs back at Nineveh, but really quite extraordinary. So I, not literally a photograph, but about as close as you could get for people living in the ancient world. It's it's the coolest thing. A couple of things on there too that I think are, are neat. The slingers doing the sling stones is really it was a really cool image because you think of David, of course, when you see that. Yes. Uh, and we read about this in the biblical text, and there's lots of stuff from antiquity. But you see the, you know, the these men in the military garb getting ready to throw their sling stones in battle. Another part, I think, I, if I remember right, there's there's a lot. I'm just hitting a couple of uh, these poor souls who are being skinned alive. Yes, by the Assyrians, and it's a reminder of the brutality 
uh, of the Assyrian Empire and what the Israelites were facing, uh, the wickedness of, uh, they were a ruthless people. It also gives us, whenever I see that, that uh, relief uh, of those poor souls being skinned alive, it makes me think of Jonah uh, running basically to Spain yep. because it, it kind of reminds you of the wickedness of them and that yet God's mercy can extend that far. So lots to draw out of there, and those are just a couple of little small observations that I've made over the years, but I, those reliefs are powerful, extraordinary. And it's a, it, like you said, extraordinary that they've been preserved. I mean, it's just yeah. lowercase m, a miraculous. Yeah. You mentioned that they're like pictures. Um, in the early days of movies, movies were called moving pictures. And I, I view these reliefs much like the the ancient equivalent of movies, only instead of the pictures moving, you moved. You you walked along, and, it, and as you walked panel by panel by panel by panel by panel by panel, it tol- tells the story of the siege of Lachish. And so just, yeah, just uh, spectacular. So had to include it uh, as its own item in the list of top 10. Yeah, excellent choice. Awesome. All right, moving on. What's next? Number three, the Silver Ketafhenim Scrolls. In 1979-80, there were some excavations that were led by uh, Gabi Barkai in a series of burial caves uh, at Ketaf Himen, and it led to the discovery of these two silver rolled-up amulets. And when they unrolled them, they they realized that what was on them was uh, pieces uh, of biblical passages, uh, including the, the priestly benediction. And they dated them to the 7th century BC. And so for to remind our, our, our listeners, the priestly benediction is found in Numbers 6, 24 to 26. It reads, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. And the silver scroll reads, May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh cause his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. And then further tests in 1994 resulted in these new high-resolution digital photographs, and they allowed scholars to trace uh, new letters and clarify those that were difficult to read, and then again confirm that it dates to the late 7th, early 6th century BC. So what this means is that this is the oldest portion of Scripture ever found and it significantly predates the earliest Dead Sea Scrolls. And it also contains, again, a very ancient extra-biblical reference to Yahweh, which, which, as we've said, is really important when it comes to inscriptions that are found in Israel. And it provides evidence, I think, that the books of Moses were not written in the post-exilic period write down um, hundreds of years, um, even after the Ket of Him and Scrolls is, is when they would, some people would put these, these books of Moses being written. It, it demonstrates that already by the 7th century BC, portions at least of the book of Moses were well known. Uh, this priestly blessing was being used by the people and, and so couldn't have been written hundreds of years afterwards like some people have suggested. I think that's one of the... I mean, the, the scrolls are amazing and that they're in this earlier script, this paleo Hebrew is of great significance. I mean, we know that the Hebrew alphabet went through development and evolved over time, much less like English does and every other language has its, its own evolution as it were, small e. <laughs> but um, to your point, you know, here we have a tomb and as far as we know, it's not of a king, it's outside the city of Jerusalem. So yeah. We have this amulet there with a biblical text in it. It's, it's uh, shall we say, a coincidence that we found it in the sense that this is not from like a temple archive or from an official place where, where the central authorities were in control of the biblical text, right? The scrolls of, 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 that were in the temple, that sort of thing. Just an ordinary citizen where the benediction is recorded in a condensed form that points to a widespread dissemination of the text exactly alre- yes. already uh amongst the people it just really goes against it doesn't fit well with this other paradigm that you mentioned that these texts arose uh much later you know or were developed later or came together later 
Uh, I, I find it extraordinary. The other thing too, Brian, is uh, folks may notice in our conversation, you mentioned the bole before Hezekiah. I mean, what yeah. are they like? A centimeter or yeah, two? Small, small. Right. We mentioned the Mount Ebal tablet. It's the size of maybe a postage stamp or a yep. postage stamp and a half. And then these scrolls. I'm 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 always amazed how extraordinary people in antiquity wrote so small. We do, do we do that in the modern day? I, <laughs> no. I don't know that we do that very much. I guess it's not necessary, but it's really neat the way they revered the word of God in such a way that they would do something like this. Yeah, no, that's true. And I think it wasn't the the person who f- actually found these, wasn't he uh, a member of ABR? Yeah, it was G- Gordon Franz was a member of uh, Gabby Barkai's dig staff mm-hmm. and uh, later became a member of, uh, was on ABR staff. Okay. Now he found them before he was on the staff and he's since left, but that's a great connection for our ministry. Gordon wrote about this. We have, we've got some articles on our website about the scrolls. Another one written by Steve Caesar a number of years ago, probably needs to be updated actually because of some of the new uh, technology looking at the scrolls. But anyway, the point of that is, yeah, we have a little bit of a, of a connection Side there connection. Through, through ABR. All right. Uh, getting close to the, the top. What, what's number two? What's the runner up? All right. The runner up is, uh, and this was hard. I, I mean, I went back and forth between one and two, but uh, number two, I went with the Telden uh, Stila. And so just to set maybe the context for this, there were through the eighties, right. And early nineties, there was this, this big movement that's maybe been called uh, Bible minimalism, which believed uh, there were these scholars who believed that the Bible was of minimal value historically. And one of their favorite whipping boys was King David. Uh, For example, uh, University of Sheffield professor uh, Dr. Philip R. Davies famously stated, I'm not the only scholar who suspects that the figure of King David is about as historical as King Arthur. And so uh, minimalists would say, you know, King David never ruled over an expanded kingdom the way the Bible describes, probably as more legend and myth than reality. But then, in 1993, archaeologists were digging at Tel Dan, the site of the ancient city of Dan in northern Israel, and while excavating, they discovered a broken stone, about 32 centimeters high, 22 centimeters wide, that had an Aramaic inscription on it. And the next year, two more fragments of, of the, the monument were unearthed. And when they translated it, it just sent this instant sensational uh, sensation through the world of biblical archaeology. And it, and it really did put minimalists who had uh, crowed about the fact that there was no evidence for King David outside of the Bible, put them squarely on the defensive because... The Stella appears to record the victory of a king of Aram, who is not named, but almost certainly is Hazael. And it describes his victory over Omni, the king of Israel, and his ally of the house of David. And it dates to the 9th century BC, so about 200 years after David's rule. And basically, the king of Aram is saying that he 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 killed a, a king of the house of Omri, and he killed a king of the house of David. And it was this phrase, the house of David, that really uh, stands out on this particular artifact. And archaeologist Joseph Garfinkel explains the importance. He says, look, house of David means dynasty of David. So now we know there was a person named David and that he had a dynasty. And this is clear now that David is not a mythological figure. And so the mythological paradigm collapses in one moment, he says, with this particular find. So, well, like, when I think of the House of David, that makes me think of a modern-day example, the House of Windsor, the Queen of England, the King of England, that whole, their dynasty, this is a similar thing where they have all of those. So that's what comes to my mind. Yeah, it's good. I hadn't thought of it that way, but, you know, it shows you how a sort of expressions or colloquialisms carry over through the centuries in human societies and language. There's a lot there. Again, this is another hostile witness. Yep referencing and, and, and also again, the house of David. So it's showing that David is sort of the quintessential King. You know, he's the King that they have in mind here when, when they're writing this Stila. What we've found interesting over the years is the sort of debate about this interpretation. 
and how scholars have squabbled over, does it say House of David? And some have said it says House of Kettle or something like that, I think sure, is, yeah. is one of the uh, arguments. But as it, as we continue to to study it, it just becomes more like, no, it's David. And it, it, it's, it's so interesting to see how hard sometimes it is for paradigms to change. Now, what's also interesting, Brian, maybe you can comment on this, is <laughs> this is the challenge that we face. Some of the, the skeptical scholars will concede, but then shift the goalposts. So they'll concede, okay, okay, David's a real guy, but he was just a tribal chieftain of a podunk cow town known as Jerusalem. He didn't really have a kingdom the way the Bible describes it. So this is sort of amusing and infuriating all at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I, I, because this is, a, this is something we struggle with. Maybe... Uh, give us some commentary on that, if you would. Sure, I, th- I think it was um, Israel Finkelstein who who famously said that uh, that uh, David was was really probably nothing more than a tribal chieftain with a couple hundred people swearing and 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 shaking pointed <laughs> sticks. Right, that's that's essentially the the element. But again, we come to the fact that this inscription is two hundred years after the fact. the The kings of Judah are still known by the title, the House of David. In the same way, I would argue that hundreds of years after the fact, the kings of Israel in Assyrian writings are known as being from Omri land, from the, from the House of Omri. And so I think that that's really important. And the, the other thing I think that's really important too is that if you look at God's covenant with David, what does God promise David he promises that he will establish his house. That word house is actually used in, in the covenant with David. He will establish his house. He will establish a king who will reign forever. And, and so 200 years later, what do we see after David? We still see the house of David, the dynasty of David still standing. And we have evidence of that from this particular artifact. All right. The uh, number one, and I, I think it's probably one that uh, most people have heard of. Yeah, I would be surprised if people haven't. This is the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is the number one find in biblical archaeology relating to the Old Testament, in my opinion. Um, So just a a little bit of the story. In 1947, there was a Bedouin goat herder who accidentally discovered several manuscripts in a cave at Qumran near the Dead Sea. Um, The the story is told how he was throwing stones into a cave and and heard some pottery, uh, you know, break and and was able to scramble up and, and, and look at it. He took the scrolls, he delivered them to a Christian antiquities dealer in Bethlehem, and that of of course, he recognized the importance of them. This caught the attention of scholars worldwide. And so between 1947 and 1956, there were numerous excavations uh, of more than 30 caves in the area, which resulted in discovering more scrolls in 11 of those caves. So in all, from those excavations, there were over 980 manuscripts dating from the 3rd century BC to the 1st century AD, and 230 of those manuscripts turned out to be portions of the Hebrew Scriptures. And while most of these manuscripts are fragmentary, there was probably the most spectacular one is the Great Isaiah Scroll, which is a complete scroll of the book of Isaiah. Scholars have noted that every book of the Old Testament is represented, uh, except for the book of Esther. And before the discovery, this is kind of why it's important. Before the discovery, the earliest complete Old Testament manuscript was the Leningrad Codex, which dated to about 1000 AD. And then with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, this allowed scholars to see how much the biblical text had changed in a thousand years. And the answer was, very little had changed in the biblical text over a thousand years of transmission. And this is transmission by hand, remember, at this particular time. Some scholars sum up the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls this way. The the scrolls provide an important link in an unbroken chain of texts that contribute to establishing the textual reliability of the Old Testament scriptures. So because of this, these scrolls are still being studied to this day. And not only do we have, of course, the the biblical scrolls, there are commentaries on some of the biblical texts within the scrolls from this uh, group at Qumran. And so that was my choice for the number one discovery in biblical archaeology related to the Old Testament. Amen to that. I mean, you can't go wrong with the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's 
They're extraordinary. Uh, here's another uh, interesting element of the of the scrolls. Uh, it also gives us some sort of background. You mentioned this about the commentary uh, regarding sort of uh, different ideas in Judaism sort of floating out there in intertestamental Judaism and then into the New Testament period. Even some of the some of the ideas that we see actually in the New Testament, not to say that they borrowed from this community, but that these were ideas that turned out to be correct ideas because they're in the New Testament. Things like predestination, sort of election, that kind of idea. Now, I know that's not our thing, and there's different theological perspectives out there. But the point of that is just simply that idea was not a new idea in the way that some Jews thought about it. Phrases like the sons of light, which is what Jesus talks about. So fascinating, right? So Jesus is taking this background that we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls and using it as an illustration of those who follow him. Really fascinating. Uh, there's a Melchizedek scroll shows the importance of Melchizedek. You know, uh, obviously we, there's great importance there in the book of Hebrews and the new Testament period. So, and I, let me add this comment and then I'll let you jump back in, Brian. And even in places where we do see variation, a lot of times the scholars overplay their hand and in, in the meaning of the variation in the text, they'll point to differences between what's in the, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls and what we have in what we call the Masoretic text and kind of like conclude that there was this wild fluctuation in the text and all that. But a lot of times these texts are were used for teaching purposes. I always say, take your pastoral notes, Brian, bury them in the ground, and then have somebody dig them up a thousand years from now and conclude that, see, there's this wild variation in the text. Well, maybe you reorganize the material for liturgical purposes, for teaching purposes, right? For pedagogical purposes. You didn't change the Bible. You just did some reorganizing. So we do find that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but the conclusion that skeptical scholars often draw, I think is the wrong one. People didn't always try to just copy the scrolls like a photograph. Sometimes they had different purposes in mind, but that doesn't undermine the stability of the text and the reliability of it, which is what you pointed out. Yeah, and the changes that are there are are relatively minor, and no theological issue in the the Old Testament that we have those texts from that we can compare with have changed. They're, they're minor textual changes: a letter here, a letter there, a word that's that's different but doesn't change the meaning of the text. So, so relatively minor. The other thing which is interesting, uh, I did a study a few years ago where I looked at the messianic expectations that are in the Gospels, where people are talking about was they're trying to figure out if Jesus is the Messiah, and there seems to be a fairly wide variety of views about these expectations about the Messiah. Where would he be born? Would, you know, who would come first? And, and different things. What would he do? And when we go to the Qumran community, what we find in some of the Dead Sea Scrolls is, again, this variety of messianic expectations. So people were waiting for the Messiah, and they seem to have this variety of views about who the Messiah would be, or what would he be like, or what would he do? And, and what we see in the Qumran scrolls is, is very similar in terms of a variety that we see within the New Testament Gospels themselves. And, and I think that, that that's important to see, again, the, the New Testament Gospels and the Qumran scrolls, again, similar time frames, first century AD for some of them, and we see that the things that the Gospels describe the people wondering about, we see kind of similar things within the Qumran community as well. Yeah, good, good and stuff. For me, uh, when I look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, to me, again, it, it just hammers at the fact that the Bible is the Bible is many things, but in addition, it is certainly a historical document. And particularly when we're reading about these people, I, I often tell the the teenagers in, in, that I work with, right? These are these are actual people. These are accurately described 
places. This is authentic history that is being described here, not some made-up mythology written hundreds or a thousand years later to give Israel this glorious backstory for their people, as some people suggest with some theories of how the Bible was made. This is this is accurately described, and we don't get all the details, just like we don't get all the details from other things in history, but we the details that we do have fit. Yeah, it's good. I can, can I ask you a question about uh you said about youth. I know you work as a pastor with youth. I speak sometimes to young people, you know, like at at schools. I just spoke in fact yesterday at my daughter's school, a Christian school in their chapel. You know, I talked about King David, brought up sling stone and that kind of thing. Yeah. But in my mind in my mind is there are great stories like Lord of the Rings, Narnia, right? If you want to think about two great stories, but they're not real. What what kind of reaction do you generally find from students when you're making these connections to say, no, 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 don't process this in your mind as just a story? Like, what what is your general impression of how they respond to your teaching in that way? Well, I'll, I'll maybe answer that with a with a story. I was speaking at a at a Bible camp, and the week it was a teen camp. The text for the week was Hebrews eleven, and in our morning chapel sessions, I was uh, I was looking at the historical evidence for some of the major people who are named in Hebrews eleven, and then in the evening we were kind of preaching about faith. So the the evenings were kind of sermons, and the mornings were more like seminars. And I remember this girl came up to me after about partway through the week and she her eyes were just really big. And she said, Thank you. Oh my, oh my goodness, these people really existed. They were really, they were real people. Hmm. And I said, Yes, I believe they are. Now here's the thing. I knew this girl. I knew what church she went to. I knew that she came to camp every summer to this Bible camp. I knew that she went to the Iwana Club at her church and Sunday school. And I thought at that time, Oh my goodness, here's a person who is raised in the church, who is harboring these secret doubts that these people are real. And so for this particular person, it was it was just a was something that was able to help build their faith, right? You think of Luke. When Luke wrote his gospel, what did he say? I, I, he said, he said, I'm Theophilus. I, I'm writing, I've researched this. Um, many people have 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 taken to to draw up an account of Jesus. I've researched it too, so I'm I'm writing this so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. And I take in that this this principle that good research into biblical stuff historically, the events of the Bible, should help people to have their faith strengthened, that they may know the certainty of the things that have been taught. Amen to that. That's a wonderful story, Brian. I think it's it's encouraging to to me to hear that, and I and I, I see the same kind of reactions, you know, from young people. And I think the more we communicate that to them, and it's just encouraging a, a parents out there that you know there are answers to these these things, and if we can help our children to cognitively connect the scriptures that to the reality that these things happened, I think it makes I think it can make a real difference. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If you want to see all the things we talked about today, photos and more details, Brian has this list available at BibleArchaeologyReport.com. And we'll also have a link for you in the show notes. That's all we have for today. Until next time. Digging for Truth is a presentation of the Associates for Biblical Research. To find out more about ABR, just go to BibleArchaeology.org.